Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint, the host today is Richard Fields. Our guests are James Just and John Cameron. Now, here's Richard. Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. Welcome James, welcome John, moving on to the CBO, uh, the Congressional Budget Office, no less, has come out with a budget projection that says that, uh, hey, we don't have any money. Uh, and, and the interesting thing about it, I thought, was that the, uh, the budget projection essentially says that not only do we not have any money going forward, but the reason we don't have any money going forward, or one of the reasons, and of course, this was done pre-COVID, pre-COVID uh, lockdown. So it was before all of the uh, drastic uh, uh, machinations of the last uh, 12 months or so. Uh, they said one of the reasons why we have, have slow economic growth is because we have slow population growth. Why do we have slow population growth? Well, our, our replenishment rate, the, the rate at which people are having kids, <coughs> is falling into negative territory. People are not having, uh, people that live in the, in, in the country are not having enough kids to, uh, to grow the population. So, you know, the birth rate is well below uh, two per couple. Not only that, but we're having lowered immigration rates. Why are we having lower immigration rates? Well, a whole lot of reasons, but the biggest one is uh, plain old ordinary nativism. We're afraid of the other coming in and so-called taking over. Uh, but the, the, the net effect is without, you know, with, with a lowering population growth or negative population growth among natives and not welcoming uh, immigrants, we have uh, limited the amount of economic growth that can take place for the simple reason that in order for economic growth to take place, you have to have willing people to actually go out and do the work that causes the growth. Thoughts, James, just James or John, I'm sorry. Well, this is actually not something that's unknown. We've in the last few years, places like Denmark have had the same issue. They've had a campaign in Denmark, what, two years ago, do it for Denmark, where they're actually having public service announcements telling people to go out and have sex with your partner so you can have more kids because we're not replacing our population enough. It's the same problem. We have the same problem that all these advanced countries have at some point is life is too good to want to have five, six kids. And, but yet the, our economics are based around us having a continually expanding population. And you know, those two forces come to a head. And then when you have us in debt for $28 trillion or whatever the heck it is now, it, uh, someday all these bills have to get paid. And, Who's going to pay them? Well, the, who's going to pay them is whoever pays the uh, cost in inflation, which is yeah. which is exactly exactly where where it's going. Which kind of leads us to the the next topic, which is Ray Dalio, the head of Bridgewater, the largest hedge fund uh, in the uh, universe. This is a guy that uh, obviously knows what he's doing when it comes to investing. He's uh, a guru beyond guru, and he's saying. Uh, don't invest in bonds. It's stupid. Don't invest in bonds. Well, the you know standard investment advice you would know this, John, being a, an old uh, investment advisor, is what sixty percent uh, bonds, thirty forty percent stocks, or your age in in, in stocks uh, minus uh, you know, and then uh, and the rest in bonds, something along those lines. That well, that that, that's, that doesn't work anymore, does it? No, well, and it hasn't worked for a while. I mean, they, basically, even though the stated interest rate isn't negative, the effective interest rate, I think the number uh, Dalio in the, in the article you were kind enough to send, send around to us said that uh, you know, if you invested your money in bonds um, and factored in inflation, even the official number, it would take you something like 500 years to get a return on your investment. So... Um, you know, and the problem is that all this debt is supposedly paid for by U.S. Treasuries, but a lot of people are saying anybody who buys Treasuries is stupid. And then, you know, all our house of cards is built on uh, a lot of foreign countries holding our bonds. But if those bonds aren't paying anything, why should they hold them? And, and I wasn't an investment advisor. I was a stockbroker back when they were honest enough to call us stockbrokers. Now they're called investment advisors. Yeah, I advise, and you know, mostly you still people do it the same. They they go down the list, and I advise you to buy the one with the the, the highest commission. No, that's they they pay people now on the amount of money um, invested generally. So I think I think bonds have always been. You know, uh, I remember a time when I was uh, calling people up and telling them that they should buy. 
uh, jumbo CDs at uh, that were paying 15 percent, and uh, treasuries were paying 12. And I said, there's a 300 basis point difference between a jumbo CD and treasury, a 400 basis point, and, and that's going to disappear. That's back when we had a, uh, uh, you know, a head of the Fed named Volcker who decided to uh, uh, put a stop to Jimmy Carter trying to uh, inflate his way out of a, a, a deficit. So have you tried that, that now uh, and interest rates go up? It, you can't, I mean, the, the, all, the, all the numbers that we're looking at are based upon the idea that interest rates are going to be pretty much realistically zero. So if you had to pay 5% uh, on that $27 trillion, guys, you guys do the math, then interest alone uh, would be a trillion and a half dollars. So uh, I, don't, I don't know how these people are going to are gonna work their way out of this. And, and the, same, the same thing said that uh, by 2050, we're looking at formally, formally, a hundred trillion dollars or two times the estimated gross national product, gross domestic product uh, in debt uh, at 2050. And I think the way that the current government has, uh, has shown that they can spend money they don't have, that's, you know, and if you factor in all the unfunded pension debt, and Richard, you got this number, how, what, what is the real uh, debt that's out there in the U.S. Well, it's well over 100 trillion. And it, it, it depends on your assumptions, but it's, yeah. it's you know it's over 100 trillion when you take into account the uh, unfunded Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, pensions, uh, you know, railroad retirement, all the rest, all of it. Uh, it it's well over 100 trillion. Yeah. Um, the, you know, the other interesting thing about this whole uh, whole mess is that uh, we had a, a conversation a few uh, a few shows ago about the intelligence of the American public uh, to figure out what's going on and, and not to, to uh, put up with this. I just came across an article in the uh, Washington Post, no less, that says that Congress, congressmen or Congress critters are as popular now as they've ever been. They're reaching a new height in popularity. Why? Because they're voting to give $1,400 payments to the people. Well, which, that new height is pretty low, though. That new height is an awfully low number. True, but it's yeah. moving in the wrong yeah. direction, given what Congress is doing. It brings to mind the, uh, the, the Tocqueville quote, which is, uh, a democracy will only last as long as Congress doesn't figure out that they can buy elections from the public purse. And mm -hmm. that's exactly what Congress has very gradually but convincingly done over the last mm -hmm. uh uh, last 20, 30 years, and certainly, certainly uh, it's, it's accelerated just in the last year or two. Yeah, well, I think it, it's not even a secret. secret. What did you say on in the Georgia election yeah. after the uh, November election? It's you vote for Democrats and you'll get 2,000 bucks. And then, of course, you know, a week later, so $2,000 became $1,400. So, so they're not even hiding it anymore, Richard. They're just openly doing it. They say, here's some money, vote for me, here's some money. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, and, and the, the, the fact that the, the, uh, the government schools have actually dumbed down the populace uh, to the point, and then you, you go to the, the uh, how, many, how many universities teach uh, the German School of Economics now in the country? Two, Austria, you mean? Austria. Austria. Yeah. yeah. Two, as far as I know. Yeah, George, Mason and, George Mason and Hillsdale. Probably. Yeah, now they're, you know, now they're starting to, to teach... Uh, um, you know, not only Aztec gods as deities here in California schools, but they're, you know, they're teaching uh, uh, modern monetary theory uh, as if it were a fact. They taught, they taught Keynesian theory, and even Keynesian theory would buckle under the amount of debt that, that, that they're, you know, money they're printing. So they had to come up with a new fallacy to teach to people. And, you know, the, the, it just shows that People in government do not care about the voting populace. They do not care about the well-being of the country. They do not care about children or old people. All they care about is getting elected so that they can take money from one group of people and give it to the people that help them get in power and stay in power. And that's well, it's even, more, it's, even, it's even more, I'm even more cynical than that. They care about getting elected so they can get on the, get in the turnstile between big lobbying interests and uh, and government so that yeah. they can be in government for uh, you know two or three terms and then they can go to work for lockheed or 
uh, the hospital um, lobbying association or the education lobbying mm -hmm. association or whatever it is and get paid the big bucks because they know the people in government and they can uh, mm -hmm. twist arms effectively. That's that's mm -hmm. what that's what that's what politicians are all about anymore. And then they only all the have way, to all serve. the way from the, all the way from the state house to the presidential level. And then they only have to serve one term, I think, as a as a senator or or a representative to have that uh, platinum diamond uh, coated uh, pension for the rest of their lives, and you know medical care and retirement and all the rest of that. So, yeah, I think I. I you know, the, the bummer is that even a revolution wouldn't fix it because the people that win revolutions aren't, aren't the people uh, who are concerned about, um, you know, what happens to, the, to whatever country's having a revolution. It's the people who are willing to uh, be the most brutal during the revolution. Uh, you know, the, the Soviet Union revolution basically was, was started by a bunch of capitalists who believed in demo, democracy and who won. Uh, the people who are willing to kill the most people. And even they discovered uh, that that communism slash socialism slash, slash central planning didn't work, uh, even in the even in the country where it was basically invented. So uh, I, the, yeah. The Bolsheviks, the Bolsheviks won the Russian Revolution and the, uh, the mobsters won the, uh, the, uh, the post-1989 uh, effective revolution in Russia. Yeah. So now you've got mobocracy, which is slightly better than communism, but not a lot. No, no, and we're you know I don't I don't know what you call it, what we have here. It is it is it's a strange world. I well, it's, it's, it's 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 mercantilism. It's yeah. you know it's the rule of the large institutions over the individual and small market mm -hmm. or small small business. Uh, you know which which uh, brings up the the issue of how. Uh, especially uh, with all of the uh, the lockdowns, we have big government uh, stacking the deck tremendously in favor of large corporations. I'm talking Amazon, I'm talking uh, Costco, I'm talking uh, Facebook, uh, Microsoft. All of the, you know the the Fang stocks have done exceedingly well, both in the stock market and in the real market in the real economy as a result of the lockdown. Main Street. Ma and pa stores, not so much. No, I, I absolutely agree that's the case. And, and I'm my cynical view of that is it's 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 even more simple than than the mercantilism you're talking about. Uh, people who are entrepreneurial, who uh, start and run small businesses, which 50 percent of the jobs in this country are, are, are in small businesses, do not vote. For big government, they do not vote for big government institutions. They don't vote for handouts. There are people who believe in bootstrapping, and uh, so those in power absolutely do not care if their doors are closed and their employees starve and they starve. What they want to do is make sure that those people who write the big checks um, and who who support big government uh, are are. Uh, basically paid off by whatever rules they have. I think only 5% of small businesses, uh, according to one study I saw, uh, got the pay paycheck protection loans, you know, loans that are forgiven if you keep a business open. And now, you know, all the newspapers and websites, there are newspapers, sorry, for your younger viewers, the websites uh, and social media are trumpeting another surge, which... You know, it's it, you know, the longer this lockdown happens, the more the more power can be assumed by big government and big corporate America, and the worse off it's going to be for folks who are trying to run that lawn care business or that hair salon or that restaurant. Yeah, I, I, there was news breaking just as this show started that Biden has uh, asked Americans to continue to be masked up and locked down, uh, and for the states not to open up for another who knows how long. Uh, somebody at the CDC said, I feel like we're, uh, you know, in impending doom mm -hmm. with all of the reopening that's going on. Yeah, meanwhile, the facts, meanwhile, the facts show conclusively that mm -hmm. those states which have opened up have done very well economically, very low unemployment comparatively. Those states who locked down the worst, New York, California, New York, California, are you listening, have done the worst in terms of higher unemployment and the results as far as deaths from the coronavirus or while having 
you know, uh, with the coronavirus, not of the coronavirus. Either way, the deaths are, are approximately the same. Mm. The coronavirus has not really affected the uh, the death rate one way or the other, depending on how, mu how, how much the lockdown was. But the economy has suffered dramatically. There's a there's a book out there that I wish I would. Uh, can we? I'll I'll remind you to put it on on the topic list for the other show that talks about the the lives lost not only, you know, during the lockdown, but after the lockdown. And what's really weird is the WHO has said, and the CD has said, CDC has said, that lockdowns aren't a long-term solution to this. They're only to be used for like a short-term emergency period. But we continue to lock down, and then clowns will come out from the CDC, like, and the quote that you just said, that we need to lock down again because of the, the surge in virus. But you know, if you if you look at the numbers, I'm not seeing this surge. Uh, every place I look in the country, with very rare exception, uh, the number of, of, you know, the deaths is the trailing indicator. The number of people who are getting sick and admitted to hospitals, even in California, the ICUs are, are basically empty. You know, we're building up herd immunity on the one hand and people are getting vaccinated on the other you know, the people who are at greatest risk have learned to take care of themselves and the people who might infect those have learned to be smart about infecting them and on and on and on. So I, I have no idea where they're, where they're coming from and what they're saying other than the fact that lockdowns are good for Big Brother. And so we'll continue to have them. Good for Big Brother day. and Big Business. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and you forget that there's a, there's a mindset out there that if the government isn't doing something, you're not doing anything. Hmm. So the part of the reason we go to lockdowns is we have to do something. We have to do something. Well, you can do something without passing laws. You can do something without passing restrictions. You can do something without government action. Mm -hmm. You know, we all can do something. We can all wear a mask or we can all be more careful about where we go. We can all socially distance. You don't actually need laws for that. Well, and that's we, what, and just for the record, I don't have a problem with wearing a mask or socially distancing when, you know, when it makes sense. I, you know, when I'm in public uh, with people I don't know, uh, in close proximity, I'll wear a mask. I have no problem with that. I will also make my, you know, maintain a great deal of distance away from people who look like they might be sick, uh, and people who are perfectly healthy that uh, may be sick. You know, I, I don't know. I don't know what people's health is, but I did that before the Corona doom. Yeah. I, I, I you know, I, I not the masking part, but certainly I, I you know, maintain a, a, a respectable distance from somebody who I think might sneeze in my face. Uh, you know, that's just that's just common courtesy and uh, self-respect and, and, you know, taking care of yourself. It's not, you know, washing your hands. I washed my hands before I had uh, the nanny state telling me I had to do it for 20 seconds. Mm -hmm. well, and, I, we didn't, and we didn't talk about the other unintended consequences of what I think John and the WHO is talking about, you know, the mental health issues and yeah. and all the various deaths of despair. You know, I've. I've been gone for a few weeks, but that was because I had to take care of myself. You know, the stresses of the last year and a half, you know, finally caught up for someone who has an anxiety disorder. You And I didn't manage my, my anxieties properly. And so I had to take some time off. But they didn't factor that kind of thing into about, okay, what kind of, what's the other causes that our policies are going to, what's the other issues that our policies are going to cause? There was no consideration. Well, let's that. talk about some of those. And when you're done, let me know when you're done, James. No, go ahead. And I'm sorry oh, yeah. about the, 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 well, let's just talk about mental health. Uh, and then we'll talk about lost cancer screenings. And then, uh, you know, we'll talk about the fact that, that how stupid all this stuff is. The second greatest comorbidity, well, first is age, Richard. So I'd be careful. Um, second is lack of activity. Yet what have the lockdowns done? The lockdowns have forced people to be inactive. So basically the government has said to stop doing the one thing that even if you're diabetic, even if you're overweight, even if you have hardening of the arteries, even if, even if, even if, even if, we'll keep you alive. You can't go to your gym. They told people not even to go outside and exercise. And people are out wearing masks with a 20 mile an hour wind with the furthest, I see them walking on the levee by the river here, the closest person, like 50 feet away, and they're wearing a freaking mask. So um, then let's talk about the average weight gain supposedly is a pound and a half for everybody under lockdown. What is the third or fourth greatest comorbidity? Obesity. 
So if you were to just say to the American people, I want you to go gain 19 pounds, let's just call it the COVID-19, and ask uh, uh, public health specialists what the cost in human lives would be to the American populace if on average everybody in the country gained 19 pounds. They would tell you it's way in excess of the 500,000 people who supposedly died from COVID in this country. And that doesn't count the mental health aspects. And then let's throw in the missed cancer screenings, which is probably conservatively another 200,000 lives. So this makes absolutely no freaking sense at all. Well, it's also Go quality ahead. of life there, John, because just some of us have missed we, we lost out on our cataract surgery. And if you're on government health care, you've now got to have to start all over again. And it's yeah. going to take another year and a half to get yeah. your cataract surgery scheduled. So, so when, you, <laughs> yeah. when you run into somebody on the road because you can't see, yeah, that costs there's, a, there's, a, there's another death. Uh, one of the things that we have, or that we, we thought might uh, happen during a Biden administration was use certain uh, medicinal products to, to relieve anxiety. I'm talking about cannabis. Uh, that doesn't seem like it's going to be happening, at least not uh, as readily as some hoped. Uh, we're seeing the Biden administration up and fire anybody who uh, put on their job application that they had in the past used cannabis. That is, except for Kamala uh, Harris and, and Pete Buttigieg. Oh, they, and his they, son. They, his son they were, Oh, okay. They, yeah. they were accepted or ex mm -hmm. accepted. Uh, what is it with the Biden administration that they can't even get civil liberties right? Of course, I guess we know we knew that. We knew that uh, Joe, old Joe, was a drug warrior from way back. Yeah, no, he's he's a drug warrior. He's personally responsible. I think we can pin a, a million black men, in, at least in prison, right at his doorstep uh, because of his insistence of taking the war on on drugs and making it even more. What diabolical than it was? It's probably more like five million uh, over the course of the the the, fact that the time that this war on drugs has been in, and and uh, the fact that that you know Biden hypocrisy is at the highest possible level. His son should have gotten out of the military with a uh, dishonorable discharge because he, because he was caught. Uh, using cocaine while in the Navy. If he'd have done that, then yeah, anyway, the the stuff that his, it, it, yeah, I, I just, I can't believe, I can't believe that any, it, despite Trump being the alternative, I still can't believe anybody voted for the guy. It's just, it's insane. No, sorry, I'm going off on a rant here. It's just, it's just crazy how hip, uh, the low level of hypocrisy and elitism that this organization has, that this, this current government is, it's just, it's sickening. It's absolutely sickening. One of, the, one of the things that's feeding into the, you know, the whole malaise that, uh, I hate to use a Jimmy Carter term, but the, the, the problems the country is facing is that people think they have a right to health care. They think they have a right to food. They think they have a right to shelter. All of these are a right to something or positive rights. Mm. And in a real and just world, there are no positive rights. Mm. You have negative rights. You have the right essentially to be left alone. You have the mm. right to not have someone else uh, control your speech. You have the right not to have somebody, uh, somebody else uh, control what you write. You have the right to practice religion and not have somebody else tell you what religion to practice, etc., and so on negative rights, things that the government can't do to you or do for you or uh, have other people do for you. You have the, you know, basically the right to be left alone. Um, it, it, I'm thinking that you know, this misunderstanding and miscategorization of what you have a right to mm -hmm. is kind of underlying the, the entire uh, cultural problems that, we, that lead to the political problems. Well, it's actually understandable if you think about it. It's government has gotten, like, say, we'll say a right to housing. Well, government has gotten so involved and had the housing market. It has so manipulated the housing market that you actually, it's kind of reasonable for someone to say, hey, there's so many rules and regulations regarding housing now that now that the government has put in so many barriers to me obtaining my own housing that they now have to provide it to me because they've created this condition where 
I can't get it. They're the reasons. Government is the reason I can't, you can't afford a housing. We don't have, you know, affordable housing. Government is the reason I can't go to a, buy a spot yard and build my own house. It's not that I can't do it. I can, you know, you can buy a chunk of property and build a house. Nothing prevents me from doing that except for the government. You have to pay the government the taxes. You have to pay the government the fees. You have to get the government guy to come in and make sure you built it right. Well, as you add all these barriers, at some point, someone says, well, you've added all these barriers that I can't myself crash through. So now you have to give me something. I, I can understand the mindset. I don't agree well, with it's, it. It's, it's, a ra it's, a rational, it's a rationalization. It's not a reason. It's a rationalization. And, and you're right. Uh, the, the, you know, the, part of the underlying problem is that, is that government has made it extremely difficult to earn a living. Minimum wage laws, build uh all of the zoning and licensing, uh, licensing, licensing and so forth laws, uh, earn a living licensing. And, you know, what, what is the percentage of jobs in the, in the country that require license? It's way too high. 40%. Uh, it, it should be, it should be zero. Uh, and the healthcare and, certificate of needs for a new hospital. That's yeah. why. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, no, I mean, government uh, in the name of, of safety and security has made it almost impossible for people to take care of themselves. And therefore people are saying, well, I can't take care of myself. You'll have to take care of me. Uh, you'll have to take care of me, Mr. Government, or Mr. Mr. Nanny State, or Mrs. Nanny State. Yeah, and rather than saying, get this nanny state off of my back so I can accomplish these things for me, people are going, well, then just give me stuff so I can not be burdened by all these burdens you put on me. Hmm. It's the, it's kind of, we've kind of chosen, well, some people have kind of chosen the, well, fine, just give me stuff so these things are no longer a burden. Rather than these things are a burden, get them out of my way. Well, the, you know, the, the, mindset's there. The, the big lie is you can be safe or you can be free. Uh, pick one. But unfortunately, if you pick safe, you're not safe. So, you know, you know people choose to give up freedom for safety. Well, just like in, in the investment market, you, you choose to give up some level of return to try to make sure that your your capital is relatively safe, rather than you know, uh, rather than investing in a, a very risky penny stock that might have a huge outcome, you invest in in the past. You invest in uh, quite a few bonds, but now bonds become worth less and worthless as time goes on. So so really, I think that maybe that then no, people aren't smart enough that they would figure out from um, you know, from the investment market, that there is no longer a safe investment. And really, uh, you have to you have to wake up in the morning, look at the world, the idea that I must assume some risk. And, and pretty much the greater risk I assume, the better my life's going to be. And the less risk I assume, the worse it's going to be. Because, you know, that given that, that, that phony choice of you can be safe or you can be free is no longer even remotely true. Because you're not free and you're certainly not safe. This is the Libertarian Counterpoint. Thank you very much for being part of the show. We'll see you again next week, same time, same place. Thank you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint Show. In Sacramento, Channel 17 on Comcast. Each Thursday at 8 